Welcome to Discovering. Tonight we'll take a trip to the remote edge of the Stonington Peninsula where we'll meet a woodcarver who's a master at turning trees into ducks. Finding a piece of wood that I believe a duck is in and you remove what isn't a duck. And a tribute to a special lady. That's all tonight, so sit back, put your feet up. It's Monday night and time for Discovery. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure, the only way I measure. Feelings that I have for this fine land, there is so much to discover when you're a long-time lover of northern Michigan. Travel to the southern end of the UP Stonington Peninsula, situated on the shores of Lake Michigan, quietly carving away on his next masterpiece. You'll find renowned woodcarver Bill Benish. I had the opportunity to visit with Bill and learn a bit about how and why he's a woodcarver. Well, I went to the University of Rhode Island and got out of school and needed a job. Couldn't find one. I ended up in a textile mill and spent about a third of my life doing that. Uh, got out of that and got in the automobile business and spent about a third of my life doing that. So I figured this is it for me because this is I'm using my my last third right here. This this is my love. This all of that got me to here. I've never had any lessons in carving. I'm left-handed and everything would be backwards anyway. Um, but I truly truly believe for me what works is I'm not carving a duck so much as I am finding a piece of wood that I believe a duck is in and you remove what isn't a duck. Uh, this particular duck that I've just started um, came from this block of wood and what I did was I did all of this detail with a with a pencil on it to make sure there really was a duck in this piece of wood. It doesn't need to be there. This is end product but I need to know before I start something that it's going to be right. Your odds of getting it right are much better that way. And I remove everything that isn't a duck. Then you, you have to end up with what you wanted. It's three-dimensional, but a bandsaw doesn't cut three-dimensionally. So you cut it in two directions. You outline and again. I put in all the detail. This is the duck I wanted to come out of that piece of wood, and I wanted to make sure it was there. You, the, the piece of wood has to be perfectly square or cutting from top to bottom or side to side. One side will be bigger or smaller and you're not going to end up with a duck. You ha everything has to be perfectly square. You draw it on two sides and then you cut it, uh, not completely off, so you lose the sides. You cut it from the top all, all the way, leave a little on each side, turn it on its side and cut it from the side almost all the way through. And then by hand you knock these pieces off and your duck comes out of that tree. From from here it's a little more complicated. It's 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 all by hand and you, you've got to have the reference work. I'm not creating anything. I'm duplicating something. I'm copying something. And to me the the best carver isn't the one whose interpretation of wins a prize. It's the one who makes it look real. To me that's the end goal is to, to end up with something real. Once I have my duck, it's then a question of what position you want this duck in, whether you want it resting, alert, sleeping, swimming, and I draw everything in with a pencil. And from there it's an awful lot of study of the of the wildlife itself. It's a lot of preparation work. There are no oopses. If if you cut something off, you can't put it back on. <laughs> What 
I'll do is do feather groups. I will start in the body of the duck. The last things I will do will be the tail and the head, and the reason is that that's where the most delicacy and, and detail is, and you really don't want a finished tail while you're spending another 50 hours working on something else. You're just, you're looking for something to break. Once I have the feather groups done, I will then work individual feathers on. Once I have the individual feathers, I will try to give character. Every feather is hand cut, and then it's wood burned. This is the wood burner. It burns one little barb at a time, and by adjusting the temperature and the speed you draw this at, start finishing your feathers, you're actually burning the depth of that feather, the, the thickness of that feather, right into the wood. It'll start with a barb down the middle. It takes a little practice to get those two lines to come together like that on the first shot. You add depth. What you're doing here is, is burning down the wood and leaving that barb raised. That'll give you some three-dimensionality. You then use what I call the push-pull method. You push your pen to the barb and then pull it out to the edge of the feather and create your individual barbs. Uh, as far as painting a duck, I do it in layers. First, I will seal uh, the bird or whatever fish, whatever I'm carving, uh, to make sure that the, the, the moisture coming in, the moisture going out is stabilized and it, 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 it'll never split. Um, and then to try to preserve the detail that I try to try to put into these things, uh, I use very, very thin washes of acrylic paint. It's a water-based paint. And I don't want to build up any depth to the paint because it, it just takes away from the detail of the feathers. So I use washes. And the, the method I use, they call it color to water. If I want a, a color to gradually fade from light to dark or dark to light, if it's going to be a dark feather in the middle and then get lighter, I will put some water with a with a brush around the edge and then put the paint on and it, when the paint hits the water it thins itself out and gets fainter and it gives you a gradual change from one color to another which is very much like what you can do with an airbrush now this was all done without an airbrush it was done just with a paintbrush it can be done a heck of a lot faster but I just I'm an old timer and I and I do everything by hand Depth of color, I build up with layers, layers of thin paint until I get what I want. You look at the bird, the, a real bird, you do your homework and, and, and get your, your studying, and uh, you just keep mixing paint till you get, get it right. It takes me about 200 hours to carve a duck like this from start to finish. Sometimes I'll, I'll do it in a straight line with nothing else in, in between. Sometimes I'll do a section of it and then go to something else and come back. But generally speaking, it's going to be about 200 hours. So you really want everything planned before you start. Part of the reason I moved here, a friend of mine, I was living in northern Wisconsin, and a friend of mine had a cabin up here, and he said the... Uh, the cedar up here, the northern cedar is fantastic. It, it's, it's just fabulous. Um, you got to go up, stay at my camp, and get yourself some cedar. Came up here, fell in love, and started walking up and down the, the roads looking for something for sale. Uh, and I've been here 25 years now. What I found, this particular pen peninsula, the Stonington Peninsula, goes back several hundred years in how famous the cedar is. This is a piece of cedar that went through the fire of 1898 on the Stonington Peninsula. The grain from here to here is 60 years of growth. It's outrageously perfect. And this carves into the into the just the best things. Most woods have a have a grain that's spaced, uneven, swirly. And this is northern white cedar, which the uh, I guess it's the Italian for it is Arbor Vita. And Arbor Vita means tree of life. And my understanding is that the French explorers uh, who came in through Hudson Bay uh, got trapped and couldn't get out. And part of what they survived on was this tree because it was always green. Uh, it didn't give them any nutrition, but it kept them alive. And that's why it's the tree of life. And it fits. This is a rough grouse feather. You cut it out and you draw in some of the detail you want to be in that feather. You, you're going to want an imperfection here, a little split here, a little overlap there. You then burn down to, to raise the barb on both sides. And then you actually, with your carving tools, I use all, all hand 
done carving knives, and, and I've made the knives myself uh, to do specific jobs. You remove the wood. It isn't part of your feather. And you put in little imperfections in the feather, like the little raised feather here. And then you burn in the barbs with this pen. And here's one with the, all the little barbs burned in. And you try to get as thin on the edges as you can because you're, you're representing a, a, a real feather. And now you're ready to paint. And there's a finished one. A lot of my customers have waited a long time to get a carving, to get a duck. Um, and so I thought, well, it'd be a good change of pace for me uh, to do something different, uh, keep me excited and in the game, and something that wouldn't take as long, wouldn't take 200 hours to carve. So I started doing some other things, like this chickadee. One of my duck customers wanted one, and through word of mouth, I had to do 30 more. <laughs> The flowers are copper. My wife is an artist. My wife made the copper flowers, and I think it, it makes it a beautiful... It's a scene. It's not uh, the duck sitting on the desk. It's a whole scene. Um, I, I'm really passionate to try to get these birds as exact as I can. I do so much background work. I may spend 300 hours studying a bird before I spend the 200 hours carving it. This one is... I, I probably did the most studying for of anything I've ever carved. I counted every feather. Um, you'll see staining on these feathers. It makes them look yellowish like there's something wrong with them. Underneath there's more. And what I found was from sitting in the water that they get the staining on there. And to, for me to be accurate, I had to paint that in. I had to, to find the right piece of wood. And I had to, to find a, a piece of wood that had a loon in it. And I got lucky, found this one on the first try. I had gathered all the reference I could find, books, uh, pictures, and then I bought some books on loons for their, for their lifestyle, how they lived, why they acted the way they did, uh, how long they lived, how they interact with nature, and, and once I felt that I knew the loon, I felt I could carve it. The, the biggest challenge on this one was whether I was going to have the grain go with the body or go with the head. And to carve against the grain is a lot more challenging and, and a lot more difficult. It took a lot of time, but it, it flowed. This, there was never any, any lull that, uh, gee, I don't know what to do with this next. I decided early on to, to show part of the leg, which is kind of unique on a, on a loon. It's got detail on it that most birds don't have. What looked real to me, the head is not just turned, it's also kinked this way. Uh, to me, that gave it a more of a, a realistic life life look. It, it was the pose that I, I wanted. That loon was up about 600 hours. It's just an awful lot, a lot of wood that got to, removed from that piece of wood to make it a loon. Pretty proud of this one. When I first started carving professionally, uh, I picked the easy ones. <laughs> first duck I ever carved was a green wing teal hen. And I waited and waited and waited because I knew that would take the most of my skills and be the most difficult would be the male wood duck. The last series I ever did was the male wood duck. My series consisted of 30 ducks to 30 collectors and I had more calls and wishes for one more. And I ended up, I think I carved 56 male wood ducks. A lot of them ended up in um, charity events, or fundraising events for Ducks Unlimited or Wildlife Unlimited um, and were auctioned off and raffled off and what a treat for me um, to have a, a room full of people who wanted it. No matter what I've done to pay the bills over the years, uh, I found that I have always, always worked with my hands. Uh, when I was in the, in the earlier parts of my life doing other things, uh, I, I've always loved the outdoors, fishing, hunting, and uh, I found that, uh, you know, I couldn't really go trout fishing without making my own trout flies. I ended up the head fly tire at L.L. Bean. 
that was when we was out east and uh, came out here. My parents retired out here and uh, needed, needed a little something to do and looking for a job. And, and I ended up on the desk of a motel in Minocqua, Wisconsin and had a lot of free time during the night and I started whittling a piece of wood and a man came to check out and said uh, how much to buy that duck and I was a duck carver and uh, that's that's my passion that's that's what I'll do till the end now I really don't want to carve 30 of anything anymore I want to do my my, my ones I've wanted to do my whole life so what I do now is now I just take commissions to do whatever anybody wants to do whether it be a duck or a songbird or a fish. I would be thrilled to take on a challenge if, if somebody who's a fan of these things or a collector of these things or, or just appreciates them. I guess the, the beauty of, of doing something like that uh, or me helping someone get something like that is you don't have to buy the one off the shelf. You get this is what I want, this is where I want to put it, this is the way it's got a face. You're dealing with the person carving it and you get what you want. Everything is one of a kind even though I've done a lot of them, and everything is, is unique. And, and I just, I have carved now full-size, detailed ducks, over 500. But I love it. I love it so much that it's, it's, not, a, it's not a chore. It's not, it's not even a job. Uh, I think I told somebody once that, uh, you know, I, in, in some ways I feel like I'm cheating because uh, I love doing it so much. I get up in the morning and, and I'm, and I, and, I, and I just, I can't wait to get at it and do it. And, and I have to tell myself, well, in order to earn carving time, uh, I gotta go split some firewood because that has to be done. That's gonna heat the house and, and you, gotta, you gotta earn the carving time. That's, this, this, is, this is recess right here. It's my passion. It's not my hobby, it's what I do. And it's not something that I'll do until I find something else. This, this is my something else. This is, this, this is what I wanna do. It just turns me inside out to have people look at it and, and tell me that uh, it looks real. I'm a lucky guy. My dad, who was in business his whole life, he's always said to me, he says, you know, you really ought to be making some money. He says, as hard as you work, you really, you're not making any money. And I told my dad, I says, well, to me, the measure of the man, nobody can, can make more time. That's the only thing you can't buy. And the man who has the most control of his time to do what he wants to do is the winner. And my dad spent years, he would fight to work 50 weeks a year to spend two weeks up here. I live here. I'm the winner. Tonight we pay tribute to a very special lady, Naomi Hult, known to most as Nehi, who passed away on October 10th. She was just shy of 93 years old. Back in 2006, Buck had the pleasure of spending some time with Nehi at the Cedar Swamp Rest Home Camp in Delta County. For over 40 years, 84-year-old Nehi Hult of Gladstone, a retired nurse, and her close friend, 79-year-old Scotty Oz, a retired school phys ed teacher, went to camp each deer season with their husbands. In an era when women were not usually found at deer camp, Nehi and Scotty were the exception to the rule. Ladies were welcome in camp then. We never questioned the fact that they weren't. We assumed we were hunting and the men never said a word. <laughs> no, Otto always said, sure, you can hunt with us. I think I made that plenty clear that if we bought this I came with it. <laughs> well, Nehi's old camp is now owned by a terrific young lad, Sean Cannon, who keeps the ladies' tradition alive by making the Cedar Swamp Rest Home still part of their lives. They call the Upper Peninsula God's country because of the Great Lakes and the uh, surrounding forest, but it's the people that live within the UP that make it so special. And the people like Naomi Halt, Nehi, as everyone knows, was a very special Uper lady that spent her entire life serving her community in Gladstone as a nurse with her husband, uh, late Dr. Otto Holt. She was an icon for women in the outdoors. She was a major contributor with the YMCA of uh, Delta County. She was a 
person to um, look up to. I would say have not literally hunted together because her blind is down there and I would drop her and then I'd go through to the north end of Shorts where uh, I've hunted for, I don't know, 10 years now. She loved the great outdoors, always was willing to help out with any community event. That's what makes Nehi Halt uh, a very special woman. If she was here today um, for the upcoming deer season, I think she would say, uh, it doesn't matter how old you are, you just get off your duff and enjoy the great outdoors. Who shot? Not me. I thought maybe you. I thought it was you. Oh, I saw nothing. Did you see anything? Oh, did you? Four. Oh, one big one. That's a productive area over there. Uh, yeah, bucker doe. I saw one big doe and three little ones. Oh, yeah. I said of that. Oh, doesn't that just fry ya? Oops, <laughs> it was Opta. Oops. Yeah, that's a good Opta one. Meta. That's Opta a good one. You don't come along too often where you have two people, especially ladies at their age, that enjoy hunting as much. <laughs> well, it's gonna happen to you, <laughs> I know. Well, I hope I can still be going at your age. Nehi to me was, um, you know, m many things. Uh, she was like a grandmother to me, a mom, uh, a best friend, and uh, she was a hunting partner. I will uh, miss her dearly, but she will never be forgotten at the Cedar Swamp Rest Home. Well, that's it for tonight. If you'd like to keep tabs on what's coming up on Discovering or see where we've been, you can join us on Facebook or go to 906outdoors.com. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week right here on Discovering. Discovering.